I'm going to talk about the benefits of sunfoin for soil, plants, and animals. I'm first going, can, can you all see? Shall I get out of the way a bit? Yeah, I'll do that. I'm first going to talk about um, the two EU projects that funded this research. Uh, and the idea there was to kickstart a new plant breeding program on sunfoin because that hasn't been done at all for this crop in Europe. I'll then talk about its benefits for soil fertility, um, its ability to withstand drought, and how its bioactive tannins can benefit animal health. So the whole idea was for these projects to be very multidisciplinary. Um, it started off with the sunfoin germplasm collection at NIAP in Cambridge, and we'll hear from a representative, Lydia, later on, uh, to explore the scientific basis for the unique benefits of sunfoin. Uh, it was linked to nutritional env environmental studies, to the antiparasitic effects of sun sunfoin, chemical composition, and the whole idea was to develop plant screening tools for a breed, uh, future um, uh, pr um, breeding program. So the effect on soil fertility are very nicely illustrated here by Matt's uh, poster. And what you can see here is that sunfoin has got a very, very long uh, taproot. Um, it also illustrates that grasses have much shorter roots than legumes. So the long tap roots of sunfoin and lucerne, of course, enable recycling of nutrients from lower down, minerals, input of organic matter to help the soil structure, nitrogen input from the legumes, um, minerals being taken up, which means that sunfoin can grow on poor quality land. There were some very interesting studies in the 1950s from the Ukraine where they measured the mass of fine root hair. And sunfoin in the Ukraine had about 16 tons of fine root mass per hectare compared to lucerne that had only four tons. So not surprisingly, sunfoin can grow on poor quality land. Now our Swiss part, oops, something has happened here. Maybe if I click again, no, sorry, there's something missing. Um, I need to explain that. Um, <coughs> on the right-hand side, this is a study done by Swiss partners. They looked at the effect of uh, the ability of sunfoin to withstand drought. On the right-hand side here, we have grasses. Um, and over a two-year period, when the plants were stressed in, uh, in plastic tunnels and received no rain. Um, each drought period lasted for about 18 weeks. Grasses lo lost so 70 to 90% of their dry matter. Legumes lost less. This here is lucerne, but they still lost dry matter. However, sunfoin, certainly some of the sunfoin varieties grew some biomass under drought stress. They looked at 30 different sunfoin accessions. Not all did as well as that, but a few of the accessions did very nicely. But they also found, uh, made another interesting discovery. If sunfoin was grown together with grasses, there were less weeds in the field. There was a better establishment in the field. And the overall mass yield was higher, and the nutritive value of the mixture also was better. Now let's now compare four different legumes. Lucerne is very widely grown for its high yield. Red, red clover is fairly well known, but both of them bloat if you put the animals on them to graze directly, or they can bloat. They don't have anthelmintic or deworming effects because they don't have bioactive tannins. But these two legumes, sunfoin and birds to food trefold, have tannins, do not bloat when, when you put animals on the land, and they are anthelmintic. 
The problem, however, is that nowhere in the world has anyone ever done any research on how to optimize the bioactivity of these tannins uh, for anthelmintic properties or nutritional benefits. So what are tannins? A very brief study in chemistry, I don't want to bore you, but there's not just one tannin compound that plants make, but thousands. You can think of them very easily in terms of different colored Lego blocks. Each block consists of three hexagons that are linked together, so this is a block, a Lego block, and they can be stuck together in many different ways. I like to think of them as in terms of sheep. They can be stuck together like very short chains of sheep, two or three, or very, very long ones, and in different formations. So, in chocolate, we eat very short, short chains of tannins, but Cerisea lespedesa is a North American legume, and it has very, very long tannin chains of about 100 tannin uni uh, Lego blocks stuck together. Now, there's another important point that we need to understand with tannins, because these units have either two OH groups or three OH groups on the right-hand side. Tannin, Lego blocks with two OH groups on the right-hand side are called prosanidin tannins. Three OH group tannins are called prodelphinidin tannins. I'll come back to these two terms later on. Our questions were, which of these are most bioactive? And one last point we need to understand with tannins is that they are sticky, very sticky, like a gecko finger. These OH groups, all of these OH groups make the tannins sticky. And they can stick, attach themselves very nicely, very strongly to proteins, such as feed protein. They coat the feed protein. And that is important because the tannin coat slows down the digestion of the protein in the rumen. And that's why tannin-containing forages don't bloat. Now to the new next two topics I want to talk about. Their effects on paras gastrointestinal parasites and the immune system. Now what I'm going to say here is probably also relevant to horses, although all of our research focused on ruminants, sheep, goat, and cattle. So you will have probably heard of anthelmintic drugs and some of the problems that can uh, occur there. Uh, you will also all have heard of the antibiotic-resistant uh, bugs in hospitals. So bacteria develop resistance against synthetic drugs. Our parasitic worms have also done that. They have become resistant against synthetic anthelmintic drugs. And the way this works is that when you deworm an animal, approximately 99.9% .9 of the worms get killed off, but the 0.1% that survives can then flourish without competition and grow a new uh, generation of resistant worms. This is costing farmers across the world billions of dollars, and there are already recorded farms where the worm populations are resistant to the three major classes of anthelmintic drugs, and those farmers in the States and South Africa can no longer keep any animals on their farms. So, it's obviously, they lose money, but it's a welfare problem as well. Um, now, tannins are not as, uh, not as effective, not as efficient as the drugs. They don't kill 99.9%, .9%, but they can interfere with the parasitic life cycle at every single stage. And the effect is that they reduce the overall number of parasites, and that then allows the animal to develop its own immune system. Maybe not a bad thing. Now let's very quickly look at this life cycle. The adult worms lay eggs into the grass, into the forage. They develop into little larvae that grow, and the infective L3 larvae are eaten by the animal. 
these infective L3 larvae have a coat that protects them in the environment, like the snake has a skin. They need to slip out of this coat, they need to ex sheath and then they become infective larvae that can dig into the tissues, into the mucosa of the animal, where they can grow into adult worms. And here are some uh, percentages of reductions that have been uh, uh, achieved by tannins in the laboratory. In real life, it might be not quite so high, but you will see we have also, uh, our partners have also got very nice results in vivo with sunfoin. This was a study done with calves in Denmark. Um, uh, the uh, calves were either fed a control of grass clover or sunfoin pellets from France, <laughs> from you. And the number of parasites of Stratagia were significantly reduced by the sunfoin pellets. Uh, when the PhD student looked at the worms isolated from these calves, he saw very clearly that in the absence of tannins, the worm surfaces were nicely smooth, beautiful worms, but in the presence of tannins, the worms were all shriveled up. Now, I was saying earlier on that tannins are sticky. They don't only, the, the way we think this operates is they don't only stick themselves to the feed protein in the diet, but they can also attach themselves to collagen, which is the major protein on the, uh, in the uh, parasite skin parasite surface. So this, we think, is the mechanism for these shriveled worms. Now, the same results were obtained with a number of other parasites as well. For example, Hemonchus contotus is a really serious parasite. Uh, used to be only in the tropics. It's migrating north. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's occurring here now as well. Without tannins, nice smooth surfaces, in the presence of tannins, shriveled parasites, but also blocked orifices, which meant that this parasite can neither feed nor reproduce. So these long tannins from Cerisia uh, lespedesa that I mentioned earlier on uh, from North America are very, very effective against Hemonchus, and in fact, this forage is the only way that some farmers can control their parasites and they can't do it with, with, with drugs anymore. We wanted to find out which of the tannins were most effective. Now, this was an in vitro study. You couldn't feed 30 different tannin types to, to, to animals. And they looked at the exsheathment in vitro study. That's where this, parasite, this larvae needs to slip out of its skin in order to infect the animal. So this is a very good in vitro essay. It sort of predicts what happens in real life in animals. And we found that tannin size, <coughs> long tannins had a better effect on the homonchus parasite, but tannin size was not important for the intestinal parasite. But both, the high, a high percentage of prodalphinidins, those were the tannins with the three OH groups, not with the two OH groups, the three OH group tannins were better. So, size matters with tannins. 3-OH groups are better than 2-OH groups. And then we looked at what happens, uh, how these tannin structures um, are distributed in the NIAB uh, sunfoin germplasm collection. You can see here very clearly that there was a huge variation between the different sunfoin uh, accessions. Sorry, Lydia, not varieties. I keep saying varieties. They're not varieties, they're accessions. And the, uh, the tannin concentrations varied to approximately twofold. Tannin size, sevenfold. Prodelphinidin percentage from 68 to 95%. Now, I would predict that these two accessions from the US and from Turkey would be worth testing for their anthelmintic effects. But don't give up yet on the UK accession because I think this one might be better in terms of nutritional properties, but I'm not going to talk about it, and that research needs to be done, although we have first-hand experience of practical applications. 
Now, the immune system is a complicated beast, and it's not my area of expertise, so please don't ask me too many questions about that area. But our partners in Copenhagen did some really exciting experiments. Because they, fa uh, so what we have here is a complicated beast. The only thing we're going to be interested in is these dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are the innate immune cells that reside in our digestive system. And tannins were able to enhance the tau-2 response of these dendritic cells. The tau-2 response is important because it helps the animal to expel parasites from its digestive tract. But more interestingly even, tannins also had an effect on the tau-1 response. They downregulated that response. That's important because the tau-1 response is involved in chronic inflammation. So tannins had a marked anti-inflammatory response. So they had two very beneficial effect, effects on the immune system. Now, not all tannins had that effect, but some tannins. So to sum up now, all tannins prevent bloat. Some tannins were able to boost the immune system and help the expel, uh, ex, uh, expulsion of the parasite. And some tannins had antimentic effects. So the long tannins had some ant ant were better antimentic effects, and prodelphinidin tannins are better against the worms. Prothanidin tannins are not so good. So to conclude, our research has now laid the foundation for a new plant breeding program on Sunfoy, and we now have the tools to do the job. And I'd like to thank you for listening, and all these partners for a very enjoyable collaboration, and the EU, of course, for funding the work. And if you want to find more information, you can get it on the web. Here are some websites, so questions. <laughs>